my best regards, Kevin Watson. Uh, thank you for the interview. Uh, could you please uh, share why did you started photographing skidhead subculture? What did you want to achieve as a photographer? That was my dream, was to be a National Geographical photographer. But I was a very poor kid and the skinhead scene came along. I became a skinhead and I literally fell in love with photography and fell in love with my friends and fell in love with the music and they both combined. There was no reason I did not take photographs of skinheads for anything other than I was a skinhead and I thought it was fantastic and I wanted to take photographs of it. And instead of being like most people that stayed being skinheads for maybe two years, me and my friends, we carried on being skinheads for eight to 10 years. And I just kept taking photographs, but they were my personal photographs. I never, ever, ever thought in a million years that the world would see them. I took them and put them in a box or gave them to my friends. Whilst I went out and tried to become a photographer, you know, get jobs, not knowing that I had the most unique archive in the world, but it had to come out in, the, in its time. But they're all my friends, all my family. I do not photograph strangers. I don't like it. I, I was a shy kid. So I felt comfortable with my gang. I felt comfortable with my friends. They felt comfortable with me. That's why I have the photographs that I do, because I was one of them. Uh, Gavin Watson, your historical archive of the photos is a cultural treasure that unlocks an intimate insight into the passion of the skinhead subculture. From your practice, what did you notice about the features of this person's their behavior, ideas? Well, with me, it was very different because I was their friend. Now, every now and again, another photographer would come from a newspaper or something to come and photograph us. And as soon as they did, then all the, you know, all the acting tough and putting the fingers up, you know, we've got to remember that punks and skinheads and ravers and um, hip, you know, hip hop, that it's all the same thing, just different variations of it. So you're not normal. You've decided to go, look at me. I'm a skinhead, I'm a punk. So, you know, they like to be in photographs. They like poses, we're posers. Otherwise we wouldn't have been anything. We would have just put on normal clothes, gone to work and probably never been photographed. But I think, you know, skinheads and punks, you know, there was a part of us that attracted each other because we wanted to be noticed. A lot of us came from broken homes. Um, a lot of that psychological impact was about the punk and skinhead scene a lot of broken people came together and joined together and had strength within that community a lot of very creative people but very broken people you know and um so very it was very much like look at me what are you looking at so it's a bit schizophrenic and of course if somebody just came in taking photographs bang 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 they you know we'd have gone what, what the fuck are you doing you know you don't do that you've got to, you've got to have respect so it totally depended on the, and skinheads are used, still used to this day by photographers. If photographers want to make an impact, oh, let's hang out with skinheads for two weeks. It's like, fuck you, do you know what I mean? I mean, I don't care anymore. I'm 55 year old grandfather and it was a long time ago, but I still don't like anyone being used. You know, I don't like, I don't like any culture being used to further somebody's career and then they reject it afterwards, you know? So, oh, well, I didn't have, I didn't have anything to do with it. I'll just photograph those skinheads. It was my life for 10 years, you know? And I suppose that's why I've got the photographs I do have because it was important to me. And I was a skinhead. I wasn't hanging around going, hi guys, can I take some photographs? I was a big, angry young man. And I wasn't thinking about photography all the time. In fact, it was just something I did. You know, more the time I was thinking about my friends, my girlfriends, are we in trouble? Is there any, <laughs> do I need to go? Is there going to be a fight this weekend? And then I took pictures when I felt like it, whilst I was trying to make my way as a photographer in the world, you know. <laughs>
seems strange now, looking back. And it wasn't until 1994, I thought I had pictures of my friends that no one was interested in. It wasn't until um, a, a curator, gallery owner saw them and went, holy shit. Oh my God, do you know what you've got? I remember him saying to me, do you know what you've got here? And I said, yes, pictures of my mates. But yeah, I've come to appreciate what I did, you know. But then we all went raving after that. So, you know, that, that, that took away all the whole skinhead gang culture from England, really. You know, skinheads aren't isolated from society. They're, you know, they're a music-based youth cult. You know, there are no skinheads without music. You know, you can, you can, you can look at mainstream media and all their lies and making up. If you're running around the woods, with a gun and a shaved head, you're not a skinhead, you're a soldier. If you're dancing to reggae in a club, you know, with your friends dressed like skinheads, you're a skinhead, you know, but the media has, the media has, has you know, totally and utterly attacked, attacked it with lies ever since day one. It's interesting, really. It fascinates me how something can come can literally its roots are multicultural but everybody in the world now thinks it's connected to nazis now, how did that happen that wasn't through grassroots that was through the media creating a narrative that they created they created the the, um, the right-wing skinheads were created politically and set amongst all us normal people and then the newspapers wrote about it and literally me and my friends were going where are all these Nazis? <laughs> you know, so it wasn't so there's a lie, there's a massive lie. And I think that's where what brings the interest in skinhead still. You know, because if I was a goth, we wouldn't be talking. <laughs> you know, because it's a fascination, that sense of danger and that sense of there is something to discover about skinheads. You know, there's something to discover is like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I just thought they were all not. Oh. You know, oh, it comes from Jamaica. Oh, they're mixed with the mods. Oh, it's like the specials are a skinhead band help free Nelson Mandela. Oh, I didn't know that. As I said, I don't give a fuck. It was a long time ago. I get passionate, but I don't really care if that makes any sense. <laughs> but I find it interesting. Because I've had to observe it because I was one of the only artists out there that was going, yes, I was a skinhead. And yes, I created this beautiful art. What are you gonna do about it? They hated it. The middle-class like, journalists, they, they wanted me to be something I wasn't. When they interviewed me, they wanted me to be some sort of, to be like them, but I wasn't. I was somebody that they would have been scared of. How do you see what attract people to unite as, as a skinhead subculture in your opinion? Uh, perhaps there are some external factors. And it looks smart. You feel smart and you feel camaraderie when you're in any gang. It's not skinheads aren't isolated from any gang. The dynamics are the same as an LA gang banging gang as to a, a gang of goths in your local town that listen to um, the cult or the cure. They're the same dynamics. You know, the skinhead thing, you're young, you relate, you attract your, your energy is attracted to the skinhead stuff more than it is the punk stuff. So you meet people you're like, you done it. What were you doing at 14? You know, what music did you like at 14 when you grew up and realized that there was boys out there and that your friends listening to this and you had a pop star on your wall and you wanted to dress like him? It's as simple as that. Our pop stars, madness, they dress like skinheads. So we dress like skinheads. Yeah, it was attention. It was just, it, you know, all of a sudden I was nobody. No, I mean, ignored in my family. I had bad dyslexia. I didn't talk till I was four. They thought that I was, yeah, they thought I was mentally <laughs> challenged. And um, <laughs> and when I got there, I got my hair cut and it was just, I transformed into literally 180 degrees different human being. I sometimes think what my parents, the shy, sensitive kid drawing all the time to the walked in the door a different human being and then I started fighting for 10 years and getting in trouble with the police and trying to take photographs and just living my life 
trying to have fun. But our sense of fun is not what normal people's sense of fun were. But, you know, a lot of my friends died. It was very brutal. It was very violent. and Because it, it was a violent time. A time of gangs, a time of heavy drug use, a time of recession, a time of great divisions within our society. And all these things jumped and sprouted out of these different dynamics sort of pulling the society in all different directions and then raving came along and just washed it all away and then skinheads around the world started being, you know a lot of guys would become um, right-wing skinheads because that's the only news that they got about skinheads and they looked smart and thought, but then again you'd see two years later they'd find out little bits and oh my god in jamaica oh there's these jamaican guys in 1969 making albums for skinheads but that's a bit odd and then you know you find this rich heritage cultural history behind it and a lot of the right-wing guys turned traditional skinheads because they it's only that they didn't have the they were attracted to it but all they had was the right-wing propaganda the propaganda spewed out by our press to do what you know to keep people at each other's throats, but they found a rich and vibrant culture, music-wise, underneath the initial the initial um, reaction to being a skinhead, which I always find makes it quite a wonderful, um, interesting culture. There's so many branches to it. You know, it's like a microcosm. It's like a, a microcosm of, of humanity. It's like anything. You know, I mean, Manson was a hippie, wasn't he? So it wasn't all love and peace, was it? You know, they were cutting babies out of people and they're part of the hippie movement. So it's, you know, you've got all sorts, you've got left-wing skinheads, you've got right-wing skinheads, but to me, a real skinhead is apolitical. You know, they're middle ground, they're proud of being working class. You know, you don't start wavering fucking badges around. Life's tough enough, for it, uh, tough enough as it is. But um, yeah, that's uh, a lot of the reason I was a skinhead was, you know, Look at me, don't look at me. How do you see the ideal life of this skinhead person in this subculture? European skinheads in their late 20s and 30s. A lot. <laughs> it's a massive culture out there. There's not that many young people, but there, is a, there are some young people. But what I think a skinhead, what it was for us, was working hard, doing a good job, going out the weekend with your friends that you love and, and, and having a great time and having your girlfriend with you and building a good concern. It's not politically conservative, but the skinhead is a very conservative cult. You know, it's all about your locality. It's all about local, being local, being, you know, it's not about internationalism. It's about being working class and local, proud of your working class roots, um, proud of your country that you have to live and die in and to make the best of what you've got, really. It was a very, to me, that was positive. It's like, you know, it's, uh, I'm good. You may not think it on the outside, but this is bettering myself. And because it was connected to the mod scene, it had that whole smart side to it with the suits and the smart side of being a skinhead. So, you, it, you know, you could dress in your workwear. If you, what was beautiful about the skinhead thing as well, coming from a recession was, the skinheads came along and you could look brilliant for cheap. You could go to the ex-army places, get an army trouser for two, three pounds, get some old boots and uh, get a t-shirt, shave your head. And, you know, you don't have to spend 2000 pounds on a pair of trainers <laughs> that you could look good in a recession, you know? And I think that that's a little aspect of it as well. But I know I think um, with most of my friends, because they're, pretty normal guys that just loved the um the culture and the clothes and because the clothes are so practical you keep wearing them you know i still wear bomber jackets um i still keep my clothing very simple and i think yeah simple life a simple conservative life where you know you don't if you don't hassle me i won't hassle you you know i'll go to a few gigs each year and then join up to to my friends so it's, that's what I think, skinhead thing. Middle ground, working hard, keeping your nose clean. You know, you might get in a punch up, but you're not scared of getting in a punch up, nothing too serious. And just, you know, yeah, building a good life for yourself, like any human being. Can I ask please about uh, your books? Published last year, 
oh what fun we had and uh, that was an italian company then probably the most important well for me i had to do this book raving 89 about the raves and i swear to god if i didn't do this book i'd be mad by now what photos um, like is ideal photo of skinhead for you for uh, thousands tens of thousands of pictures and I've got about four I like but I've never edited a book I don't want to edit I don't like editing I have got my eyes and they're a bit rubbish when it comes out I mean I don't know what anyone you you will see something I will never see so I'm just like you edit <laughs> so people will make their own the editors will make their own stories and they will choose photographs that I would have um, that's my favourite picture because I just can't believe I took some of those pictures when I was so young and they're so mature so some it was working it wasn't me you know some it was working through me it was important to get done I think you use uh, some style or maybe spontane style or like uh, Andri Cartier-Busson uh, he said that uh, his Photographing is a special moment. This third part of people, uh, they uh, studied a lot of time this subculture to understand how see uh, the person thinking or uh, doing something to meet a photo and uh, uh, to show an essence of this subculture. And for you, uh, what style uh, do you use in uh, photography? I had one camera and one lens and whatever was in that that looked good, I took. I didn't look at any other photographers. I have no other influences. This is how I do it. So, you're my friend, we're talking, we're down the pub, or I don't know, on the bus, and I'll be going, yeah, yeah, what, what are we gonna do later? And then I'll just go, bang. Um, yeah, so, yeah, well, then, then that's it. 